So the presentation I'm going to do, um, okay, it's a bit of my background, but I'll leave that to it. I'm talking about configuration management systems. Um, there's a few of them, depending on your flavor. It all started out with CF Engine, Puppet Labs, evolving to Chef, Palette kind of closure type, now a new one on the block, Ansible. So it's a field that's evolving. Um, it is not a, just a replacement for your shell scripts, so it's, it's different. It's just uh, the way, abstracting the way you manage your systems in a kind of language. Uh, so you can code up um, what you want the infrastructure to be. So that's why it's called infrastructure as code. I'm going to focus on Chef and Puppet, so sorry for the other tools. I'm not going to explore that, so I'm, I'm, because that's my experience. The other tools have merit, but I'm just going to leave it as it is. So give me the code. These are two examples, and you'll find that I'll often do Puppet and Chef, depending on what you, what you want to do. It kind of gives you a different feel of the syntax. So let's say we're going to use Puppet to install Apache. You make what I call a class. You say, install the package Apache 2. So you will immediately notice this abstracts away whether it's RPM, YUM, DBM, or whatever. It's abstracted, just install that package. The system behind it will figure out what's the, the operating system and will take that away. The same thing is with service Apache ensure running, uh, whether it's init scripts, uh, uptime, or whatever the system that actually started the, uh, the service, it will abstract that away. So this will be portable whether you run it on CentOS, on Debian, Ubuntu, it doesn't really matter. So this gives you a feel of the abstraction we're thinking about, so you don't have to type all the commands. All the commands are abstracted away, and you think about like what you want to do on the system. To give it a kind of order is that the service, before you can actually start it, requires the package. So you see there's a relationship that needs to be happening. If something changes on the package, you can send events to the service that it restarts. So it's kind of, it's not the exact syntax, but it gets you the idea across on what you want to do. The chef syntax is more just like, I would almost call it procedural. It's, that's also procedural, but it's kind of different. Package Apache 2, and it's kind of more like a Ruby-like syntax. Puppet has its own DSL, own language, own, own directives. Chef allows you to mix in Ruby code immediately. So it's a kind of difference. Uh, from experience, what I see is that admins types who think code is something strange and they've never done before, they kind of have a tendency with a strict DSL that they know that it's almost not different than an Apache config. If you know the directives, it's going to work. If you're a developer from background, I often see people start with Chef because it gives you like the Ruby syntax, the kind of all the constructs that you're used in your language but it has a kind of mixed in DSL that will make that abstraction for you. So is this code? I would consider this a kind of DSL, a kind of code. So the two systems have their own kind of terminology. Okay, Java, you have your Java code, and in your classes you make a package. You have manifests, what they call in Puppet, or extension.pp, which are actually just text files where you put your code in, or chef, you have Ruby, RB, but it's actually mixing with the chef recipes. If you bundle these things together, like the classes we saw before, like Apache and maybe some other parts, you bundle them into a module, and in chef, you bundle them into a cookbook. So you can have a cookbook Apache, cookbook MongoDB, cookbook, whatever, and start pulling these things together. 
if you have a developer background, um, what's interesting is that you will, you will look for something of the equivalent of a class. Um, in Puppet, I have something what is a parameterized class, but it's actually a singleton. You can only have that class one time installed. Like the Apache, you, if the way we defined it before, you can only install one Apache. So it, it's kind of getting used to, if you want to have that multiple things, they have a kind of construct, where, what they call a define, which is more near to a class. So you give kind of more, create a, a concept, and then you say, um, instead of saying service um, Apache 2 and package Apache 2, you make up a new keyword, which is Apache 2 install or Apache 2 server. Uh, and then you abstract that into a defined kind of macro that you can reuse into the language. So that's kind of the mechanism it works. In Chef, it's different. Um, the way you pass parameters, it's kind of like you pass in attributes to your recipes. Um, and they have something similar uh, with uh, definitions and libraries that you can use as a class. But there's no like methods of a class. So it's just like one block, which is the Apache install or the Ruby install or the, uh, the MongoDB install. Uh, but it doesn't have MongoDB dot a function. So it's, it's kind of different than what you're used to in traditional language. So I talked about like Puppet has this limited DSL, like it's on purpose. Like an admin has a restrictive set and isn't supposed to go wild like in Perl, like whatever you can do in Perl, it's cool. No, no, it's restricted. So it's a minimal set of functions. So they stay clear to everybody that's using that language that it's actually the same. It has power, but also downsides because it doesn't drive people to kind of um, combine things in a define or make more complex things. So instead of, we've talked about like the class with the DSL, you can make a definition that's already a bit more evolved there. You can make like your own way of installing packages, your own way of installing services. It's kind of the ramp up to actually use ERB uh, the, the Ruby templating mechanism to em almost embed Ruby code or use Ruby code. The Puppet community kind of often stays here and makes this hard. Although you can, and they will tell you, you can use any Ruby library, it's just that the community that's using it isn't doing that much. They have a background of administration, they love the restrictiveness, and this is hard. In Chef, they say, well, we don't like that model. Give us the full flexibility of Ruby intermixed with your DSL. So it opens up the box of Pandora, but they would probably, uh, sometimes your cookbooks in their terminology will end up being like complex code that's harder to read than a simple DSL. So it's a kind of balance uh, you want to have. Uh, they have some intermediate forms that kind of a semi uh, plug-in system for your providers. But overall, the syntax is here like uh, if you want to do a loop construct, just a simple loop like in install package uh, from an array, all these packages, that's easier in Chef. In Puppet, uh, the only thing you can do is uh, pass them to a uh, define or a class, either as one item or as an array. But you cannot even loop, you, there's no like, um, like there's, there's no do while repeat construct in the DSL. Um, often this annoys me, like if you look at a code, it doesn't look clean, but again, it's on purpose. Uh, they have another way of creating like these classes is that you define everything in a hash and then you say construct everything based on that hash. So it's kind of a different approach there. But here you can do like whatever power Ruby brings, 
just mix it in. Again, I'm not saying one system is better than the other. I'm just pointing out the differences and that you should be aware if you start using one language or the other, uh, depending on your use case. Variables, um, okay, very simple, dollar, blah, equals a string. And then if you want to have string interpolation, they use dollar, uh, what's that in English? I wouldn't know. Curly braces? Bracket? Okay. And then in, in, in Chef, it's just a Ruby native, like the hash, and you can just put that in. So it's a small difference, but it's, uh, it's one of those language constructs that come with the Ruby definition. So it told um, classes, they, there is actually, you, 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 you can inherit like a class like the Apache one, and then you build your custom, you say inherit from the Apache, you add a few extra, maybe config files you wanna add, and you go from there. But it's very hard to kind of override a class, something in a class. Um, there's uh, some experiments with like a, a plus a greater than operator that allows you to add like something to a specific class or remove something from a specific class. Uh, let's say if uh, for some reason uh, system we don't want to have the service started, we can kind of override that part, but it's not made uh, in an easy way. Uh, the trick that if you don't want to duplicate code that's from somebody else, it's almost like the class path in Java. If you put the same name from the same module or cookbook uh, in your class path in a module before, then it takes like over that class but it's, it's not really inheritance as you're used to in uh, development. So you have your code, and like a Java project, there's like a few standards in creating uh, a project. Like you would have the manifests, uh, which are the PP files I've shown earlier, uh, readme, and then there's like files you wanna have distributed, like init scripts or maybe some keys or whatever binary file you want to distribute, and then template. Uh, template is like a, the, the ERB templating that you can do based on some parameters, change a file. Um, like um, a Java startup script that actually has the parameters about what memory size or heap size or whatever you need to put in. Those things you put in templates. Chef has a bit more elaborate structure. They, you can also put the attributes, the definitions, um, special providers, but overall it's the same. The files, the recipes, and the templates, that's where people spend their most time. So it's just a convention. Uh, I guess it's very similar to a Java project. Uh, there's a standard uh, project st structure to put it in. So you've noticed in the puppet example that I use like require. So the service requires the package. So what that, in puppet, there's actually a directed graph model. Like first this, then that, then that. So in the early days, uh, and, and still now, it's used to kind of see if you specified all the correct dependencies and that the execution order is actually maintained correctly so that one resource doesn't get created before the other. Uh, so it's a, it's a design feature of Puppet that it, before it actually does something, it will take your code, construct that, what they call the catalog, directed graph, figure out all the dependencies, and then start at one point, and then start executing from there. The problem was, if you didn't specify the correct link to a few of these, uh, uh, resources, then your next run in Puppet could go in a completely different order. Because it was just taking the graph, and if there's multiple ways, it wasn't deterministic. So they changed that in that the same code will now uh, actually execute in the same order, but if you change something in your model, so your directed graph changes, you might see new ordering 
of your execution. They live by the model that everything should be hard specified, and that's the way how you do it. And if it's not specified, it's an error. Uh, that actually moved people to create Chef and say, no, no, it's, it's too hard to grasp whether on one system it follows this order, and then on the next system it follows that order. No. In Chef, it's more like, hey, if you have a recipe and that includes another recipe and so on, it will always go with that execution from top to bottom. So it's a, it's a difference. There is value about having that directed graph because you can do cool metadata modeling and see, hey, what depends on this? What depends on that? And you can use that as a prediction mechanism to see if I touch this, what's going to change on my system? With Chef, the only way you can do it is just run it and see what happens. So uh, with a traditional company, this is very valuable with a legacy system that you just can reason about, like what's going to break, what's going to change. Chefs clearly coming from the cloud say, hey, we're doing it on that system. If it fails, we're going to spin up a new system. It doesn't care. So it's kind of different in mentality. Obviously, you can use both in both worlds, but this is where it came from, and it's a kind of thing that's important to know. So we got the code. So that's, hey, like uh, I see, what was it, the, the new language that uh, Google announced, like Darth, hey, we have a new language, isn't that fantastic? So the next thing they show is the code editor. Uh, yay, <laughs> we have VI syntax highlighting. <laughs> um, at least it's better than nothing, so you don't, like, it's, it's also picky, probably on semicolons, commas, so that already helps. Um, there's improvement, so there's actually now an Eclipse ID plugin, Geppetto, that allows you to get it into your, I'm not saying favorite, but at least like an IDE that you're used to, that you can see the syntax highlighting and has support for limited refactoring and changes in names. At least it's, it's a difference. Uh, I personally still use VI and so on, but uh, it's because uh, like starting up uh, an Eclipse JVM that explodes my memory on my machine every time. This doesn't feel right, but it, it gets you over in that mindset of refactoring the structure. It helps a lot. There's another coding editor, but unfortunately I don't have a picture, but it's more like the drag and drop, where right? like, hey, you have a class, you connect it, it has that dependency, and so on. So they're currently in beta. Unfortunately, they removed the picture, but I think there's uh, cool stuff there as well that the language or the editors of the language are actually evolving in that field. Again, we're now talking about three to four years that languages and this is still the state, but again, we're getting there. So we have the code, we have the editor. Um, hey, we haven't have seen, so you only exist if you have like syntax highlighting on Git. So <laughs> luckily the guy that wrote this one, uh, then work at GitHub and put it in. So, but at least there's now rendering correctly instead of just ru ru using the Ruby highlighting. So code reviews, everything there at least makes sense. You have code, but you want to generate code. That's one of the other things that all the language is trying to do. So if you have an existing server, Blueprint will actually kind of reverse engineer your server, and then create those files for you. So you, you don't have to do it all yourself. Obviously, like all code generation, it will create too much, and you have to understand what you're doing, but at least it's cool that there's a tool out there that actually takes an existing environment and puts it into uh, that code. There's a kind of DSL on top of but but thing trails, uh, but it's not used uh, that lot, but it's it's, you, you said it was an ugly language, so trying to take away with another DSL, but it never got off. People still stay at that level. So, so you have code, you have the editor, coding style. Um, so it took us three years to actually come up with a kind of lin system. Uh, simple things like how do we indent a code? How, where do we pit like our comma? 
uh, and so on. But we got it now, and slowly all public modules are improving. Uh, like, they shouldn't have more than 80 characters. Stupid, but uh, I shouldn't be telling you uh, that that's important, that you don't want to scroll all those lines, but these things are actually now able to be checked in a lin kind of thing. Um, the shifting uh, is called food critic, and even goes further, like, uh, that require has to be there, or the string has to be in that format. Uh, so it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's em enforcing all the, what the community thinks or evolves into as a good coding practice or coding style that you can already check that. So just putting that in your code base while you're writing, run that test and see if you're com com uh, complying to these tests will give you a good insight, like why is this better? Uh, stupid thing, uh, if you put a comma um, after a line without having something else after it, then the diff that's gonna show up if you add the extra line on, uh, on, on GitHub or whatever, it's not gonna include the first line. So it's not gonna pollute. It's just simple things, but this, these are stuff. Or if you hit like a, I know Etsy's using this, if they say somebody put like a shell exec something in their code that's not supposed to be there or doesn't have a path specified or uses a wrong user. These are all stuff that you can put into this lint style of checking. So where do you comply to? So again, it's evolving, so, but it's useful. The attributes you're passing to, uh, let's say, a class with the, the parameters you can pass, um, Again, it took us like a couple of years to find out that we need to do input validation of those parameters. That it's just not whatever you pass gets executed through. So you, like uh, all good languages, you should do input and output checking that what you're actually doing. This is an example of somebody put like a schema of whatever parameters he puts in with the use of qualify and then they kind of check the arguments against the schema. I'm not saying this is very common, but it's, if you make the comparison, it's obviously something that people need to be, be aware of, that it's just not taking like whatever shell script and you run it through. You can do way more just as normal code. Um, I heard it mentioned before today, people start off by writing their uh, first uh, modules, <coughs> And then they put like uh, the username or the path or all that stuff hard coded. Or then it has to change for the server name for the dev machine and the test machine, and the production machine. So they started making cases. If on Amazon, then it's this variable. If on uh, KVM, then do this. Uh, but it's better to just separate whatever config you have from your code. And there's concepts that like Hara uh, and uh, databags that allow you to kind of look up values depending on what uh, environment you're in. I think the equivalent is like profiles or deployment profiles in Java that you separate that out of your code and just like provide it for the environment you're working in, a profile that you apply. So again, two, three years. Uh, I'm starting feeling embarrassed, but. <laughs> It's the way it is. Uh, but it's important that you drive that out. And you just remove so much complexity of your code if you start doing that. OK, that's, that's an easy one. Um, you start writing this code, and the first, well, often people just take some code from the internet, clone it, change it, never contribute it back. But why do they do that on modules? Because hey, I'm using a different service, uh, my pod's different. So all that stuff, they, they kind of set to the developers, the operations guy, you should not hard code an IP address, not hard code a pod, not hard code this. And they're like making the same mistakes and they're just forking off instead of making it generic. Like maybe it's different on CentOS, the pod, or all that stuff. So it's just, it annoys me, so that's why I put the slide in. 
like the state is currently that we're kind of, it's good that people are sharing it, but I'd love to have a way of stopping the fork. And it has to do with the in inheritance model as well. If it's not cleanly abstracted, like I ch can change one thing, uh, that's obviously another driver. You can have a look at the link below. I kind of summed up like a lot of reasons why people fork and how you can tackle those. Okay, we got the code. We got like the initial checks. So now we can do pre-commit checks. Uh, I guess you guys use it too before you commit something in the code base. We can have the lint test, the food critic test run. So at least that we know it's compliant and that happens. So nothing special. It's just some practice that we reuse from the development uh, to put things in. If you have a lot of modules together uh, that you're trying for your, using for your company, um, the first way that people started using it was they have one Git repo and they put all the modules in that one. So the, 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 the problem was if you want to share that like common one like Apache outside to other people on the internet, that became a problem because you were, everything was in one repo. Uh, then people started using Git sub modules because then they could separate it out, but I don't know if you, well, I assume you kind of have experience with Git sub modules, but the scary thing is if you put like the wrong slash at the end, it checks in the wrong thing, and, and so it's not that robust if you're not like, the experienced guy, and it's kind of. So what we evolved to is something similar like a POM file, like where you specify all your dependencies. So we can get, there's a lot of repos upstream that you can get like modules for. So this one is the MySQL one, um, but there's like for every system part, you can probably get like a default one in the community that you can just download and pull it in and start using it. So it evolved in a kind of, kind of uh, if you're familiar with a gem file on Ruby, uh, this is kind of what it came from. So the default side from the community, get the modules. I'm gonna get the cookbook one. Oh yeah, now I can also specify the version, which is pretty cool if I wanna have always the same version but I can also grab it from Git from somebody else or from my own repo. So the, the difference is uh, just like uh, bundle install, we would say librarian install and it fetches all the modules and puts them into our code base. So that allows us to share them still outside uh, and instead of uh, mixing all the histories in one big repo. And what helps is, uh, especially with Chef, is that uh, I've shown you the, the document structure, and one of it is the metadata file. Uh, okay, you have the name of who created it, but the important part is here, like, you can specify dependencies, so it automatically, if you specify it in your uh, librarian file before, it will know what other dependencies it has to download from the other locations, and get that in as well. Uh, Puppet doesn't have that construct, and there you have to say that one by one on what it depends, but this is kind of interesting with Chef, so it has another level of interaction. Um, if you have the code, um, if you start having more complex dependencies on other modules or parts of the code, the nice thing about the Puppet one, I, I told you about the uh, catalog or the model of the directed graph is that you can start visualizing it. So I can see that there's a dependency on these two and that the dependency on something else hasn't been specified. So it's kind of interesting that you can visualize that and mine that and to see where in your order or your execution uh, or even see like if I change this like visually where did I actually touch something. Um, there's a, a service even called uh, from CloudSmith where you just put the Git URL of your module and it will visualize and say, hey, this one, re 
actually depends on that, and these are the parameters you can specify. So it's getting pretty cool there uh, about visualization. I'm not saying it's useful all the time, but depending on the type of problem you want to solve, this is the kind of stuff you want to look at. Debugging, hmm. it's even worse. Um, this is not the fun thing of debugging. Just put a log level and see what happens. I told you, like the execution order, it just got through and made it happen. Uh, but, well, we've learned to live with it. Um, Chef has another way, more like a IRB, REPL style, where you can say, I'm gonna put a breakpoint here and then I can be able to inspect during the run where we are, what variables are used, uh, and so on. So it's, it's already an improvement, but I don't see it used a lot. I still see a lot of people using the logging just as the output. Like That has to be improved somehow, but it hasn't been done yet. Um, I have a bit of hope of this project. Um, simple black box, which is actually kind of... Um, so if you have a system and you're doing something on that, it takes like inputs and outputs that you can uh, monitor and, and uh, subscribe to. So it's kind of like you can see what's happening if you put kind of probes into your box. Uh, so it's another way of thinking about debugging. Uh, it's still a fairly new tool, uh, but I think it's an interesting way of just thinking of it as probes that you put on a system uh, while you're debugging or while you're doing your run. The dev environment, okay, this pretty much consensus. Uh, how many people have heard about Vagrant? A few? Okay, so if there's anything you have to re remember on this talk is that you have to start using this. And why is that so cool? It just does an abstraction library. It makes it very easy to get a virtual machine up and running. Okay, you can say I can do that with VirtualBox. But it has a very nice integration with Chef and Puppet and other provisioners. And the, the idea is that it's like VirtualBox, initially you create a system and then it starts leading its own life. Like, okay, you install, you run stuff, and it gets polluted. Uh, Vagrant makes it so easy. Like, you bring it up, you do a provision run, like run Chef or Puppet, uh, and then you can do a destroy. And if you get into that mode, there's like, no uh, leftovers, and you can always do that uh, uh, very easily. It doesn't take like the, if you looked at the virtual box CLI, there's like 50 options. Vagrant has like up, destroy, uh, provision, and just a few directives, very simple, easy to install, and you get that uh, very fast, and you get Vagrant SSH, you're in the box. Vagrant provision. So you don't have to find the IP addresses, do that hassle. So it has taken over like the whole infrastructure as code development, like they're using Vagrant. And the nice thing is you can, I see a lot more open source projects or just in general application development projects using Vagrant as a way that they provide it to their community, that they can trial it, develop on it, like in a standard way. So think about like standardizing your whole department of developers that are using the same base machine, the same way it's configured, and not like your special tuning of your JVM or whatever on your laptop and then it starts polluting. Think of it as the sandbox you've always wanted to keep that clear. I personally use that, like I have a box for customer A, B, C, and depending on what I wanna do work at, I'm just spinning up different VMs uh, what I want to do. So just clean separation. And soon it will have like Fusion and VMware uh, support as well. Uh, they're working on that. Um, if you want to build like the base machines, I've created a tool called Vivi. It creates like with a few commands, like a fully installed from ISO to a fully running system for Ubuntu, Debian, Solaris, even Windows, all that stuff. A few clicks, bam, no installing, no clicking. That's what you get. So it's that kind of level of automation that's gonna help you with that abstraction. If you don't like virtual box and 
your environment is bigger. Uh, there's a few alternatives. I'm working on McLeod, which kind of does the same thing, but for EC2, KVM, or physical hosts and Vagrant, or some, some other tool, Blimpy. So the idea is that uh, I'll just spin up uh, an EC2, destroy it, create it, destroy it, uh, just with a few commands. Um, for example, I had to use it for Hadoop stuff because my Hadoop cluster, my complexity outgrew my laptop, so that way I could very easily do that um, on EC2, and I could reuse my same recipes, modules, uh, over there uh, very easily. And it gets you into the mode like, uh, I'm running on the system, I'm changing the system, I'm coding, I'm changing the system. So it's, it's one workflow, uh, which is really powerful. Um, the only thing I can say is that you have to do it and experience it to get the power. Um, I compare it to virtualization. Uh, if you've never used virtualization before, you think it's cool, but I, I don't know actually what it is. But if you, once you start using and see the power, that's kind of uh, the difference there. Unit testing. Um, it, it was kind of there from the beginning, but nobody knew what a unit test for infrastructure as code was. Like, what are we going to test now? Like, it's, it's not like the application. Um, so the first uh, tool that came out was Cucumber Puppet. Um, and I think its main use was uh, it was using Cucumber with the BDD kind of syntax style, but it was saying, um, you know, the directed graph uh, that in Puppet, that, that was, was compiling okay. That was like a first test. Like, do I have specified all the dependencies and are there all the modules there so I can build and do a run of my system? That was the first thing. So given a node with something, when I compile the catalog, the compilation should succeed. It's not a fancy test, it's not what you expect, but at least it was like a test that was useful for us working in that environment. From there, somebody said like, hey, this Cucumber thing, there's also our spec, so let's try to figure out. Um, this is an example of a system, you know, like every kind of system has its own, f what I call facts, like it's running, in this case, OpenVZ or it has two interfaces, or it has X amount of memory. So those are all facts. Facts that you rely on making, uh, while making decisions in your infrastructure as code, saying, hey, if it, this machine has two gig memory, then I do this. If it's CentOS, I do this. So what you do is you kind of create like the set of facts that you wanna think it's using, and then you say, hey, if it's on OpenVZ, does it include the J class Java? Does this, does this class get triggered during my run or not? Uh, or if you don't want to include a kind of class, like on that system, it should never have Elasticsearch installed. So these kind of tests you could specify in that syntax. So the more nodes, the more uh, different use cases of your models you have, the more this becomes value because you can say, hey, on this system, I only want to have that module given input uh, effects do this, or on that system, I want to have it do that. So that's really helpful. Um, I think that's the equivalent of a unit test as well, like because it doesn't do anything on the system. It's just running like at the catalog or at the, the metadata level that this, it will do something or not. So <clears throat> this, if you have tests, uh, it's nice to have mocking. Uh, I shown you in the example of the facts before, it's kind of mocking. You're saying the system has these facts. Uh, assume that you're gonna run this. Uh, Chef has another one uh, where he say, Folks, hi, mock, and then you say the platform. So depending on the platform, you want to have your code do different things. So it's again a kind of mocking. I would have, personally, want to have way more mocking, like at the network layers or at the HTTP layers and all that stuff, but this is kind of the level that we're at. And then if you really you're have your uh, food critic lint tests, you have your uh, unit test, RxPec, or Cucumber Puppet, 
what you want to do if you uh, save a file, you want to have instant feedback on your laptop, whether it's still okay what you changed or not. Um, I don't know, in, um, in Ruby, uh, this kind of like guard order test, I don't know the, what the equivalent would be in Java. Does anybody know? Um, does anybody know if I change a Java file that it automatically reruns the tests and then kind of, but on your laptop? On your laptop. Yeah, it's the concept of continuous integration, but is there a, like a tool out there that allows you to? Yeah. yeah, but do you run Jenkins on your laptop? I guess not. But. Infinite tests or something? Okay. Okay, cool. So it's kind of similar. So now that we have that, you will see there's Cart, RSpec, Puppet, Lint, Chef. They kind of have that whole system. So it's just why do you do that? You want to have the feedback. Like if you change something immediately as a developer, that you do run. Um, there is a bit of a difference, and I think it's a global difference while you're doing testing for infrastructure as code, is that the cycles take longer compared to ordinary code especially if you're running on real machines and doing real runs, it's just gonna take a long time until you fe get feedback. Um, so people have been trying to speed up the process. Uh, I've mentioned Vagrant before. Uh, what it does is create a virtual machine, boots up, runs the tests uh, in it if you want. But if you wanna roll back to a previous situation and you're gonna have your test run in a clean stuff, uh, you have to do like snapshotting, rollback. Um, and if you want to do that in parallel for your testing, it's really hard because the, the effort of spinning up a new VM is quite costly every time uh, you want to do that. So Cucumber Chef actually took that and, and created like a system, well, this one is on EC2, but within an EC2 instance, they're creating like Linux containers which spin up in the order of magnitude of a few seconds. So you can have them very fast uh, running tests in separate uh, uh, virtual machines. Um, and that actually gives you a, a good boost while working on these codes and running the tests. Uh, very similar, Toft is, is something that uses Vagrant and uses Linux containers on Vagrant just because it doesn't have the overhead of spinning up those new VMs all the time. Does that make sense? That there's a disconnect between the timing or the response. Just installing a package just takes time. It's just not something you can have instantly there. But you do want to test it. So, so then the next level is, okay, you have uh, your pre-commit check, you run your test locally. Uh, I'm going to do a commit, and then I'm going to hope that CI integrations actually pick it up and rerun my tests again. Um, it's a Java ecosystem, uh, it's a Ruby ecosystem, so you might want to use CI Reporter, which converts the outputs of your test actually into test unit format, so you can reuse it in a Jenkins system very easily, that it just reports like in the same style uh, to get your syntax correctly. Otherwise, you have to parse like your output as well. So just like a, an add-on, use CI Reporter uh, in those tools, in your rake files to do that stuff. There's um, the guy who's behind the Jenkins CI Twitter handle actually created like a Vagrant plugin. So Jenkins would spin up a new VM and actually does the run very similar than on your laptop. Uh, again, um, it takes more resources to spin that up. If you want to do that on multiple machines, yeah, those CI boxes just need to be bigger or they get slower. So not mixing that during the same run as your code, but it's important to get the feedback. Even though it's not instant, it's still good feedback to see if it fails or not. So this is actually what the Travis CI guys did. <laughs> they built like a whole kind of CI service that spins up Vagrant boxes with the correct Ruby and allows you to run uh, the chef and the puppet or whatever code you want on real VM. So this is just to the extreme. It's a free service. You can just use it, and it offloads it. 
from your laptop, from your local system, but you still get the feedback that it runs in actual machines uh, contained as you want it to run. Like cross-browser testing, uh, if you're writing modules that are needed like on CentOS, on Debian, Ubuntu, and so on, maybe to back your product, uh, you want to have it test on multiple OSs at once. So the, the chef guy has brought up like test kitchen, and it allows you through the power of VB and Vagrant to spin up like different systems in different OSs and rerun the same tests on those OSs. It's, I think it's still early, but it shows you like how it's progressing, like, hey, one system, now multiple system, now getting multi OSs, and the more we can test, uh, it's just getting so cheap to run, spin up new VMs doing those tests, and especially if you are doing things at scale or multi-dependency or multi OSs, these things pay off in your kind of testing. If you want to have all integrated, there's a Bill's, desk, uh, Bill's Kitchen. It's focused on getting all the tools that I kind of talked about, but on a Windows system, because Windows and Ruby, it's kind of a hassle, and they kind of it created like a whole uh, way of doing that integration. So if you're on Windows, that's probably a very interesting project to look at, uh, so you get all the tools that you require there. So we get the systems to build, the vagrants will spin up, um, there's um, a few people that use like uh, rollback snapshotting to kind of speed up the process of instead of having to re recreate it. But there's actually really integration testing, of course, because up until now we've done like unit test integration, uh, unit tests only, and not actually run on a, the actual system. Um, so the first tool in the area that kind of sparked things was called Cucumber Nagios. Again, Cucumber description, but the nice thing was that it kind of had an integration with uh, Nagios, the monitoring system, so you could, could actually reuse your, actual, uh, your, your BDT tests as monitoring tests as well. Uh, instead of duplicating the business logic in different systems, this was a very interesting reuse. It's kind of an integration test because it actually, like here, actually goes to the URL or can go to your own URL or does stuff. Uh, so it's, I call it like integration testing because it's actually using the real system to interact with and not like the fake or unit tests on your code. Um, from there, there were a few reusable Cucumber tests for Chef, for Puppet, for other stuff that you can just reuse uh, while you're writing BDT tests. Um, again, uh, very nice to have a library, uh, Qcom and Aruba. They were kind of, uh, Aruba is also used for CLI testing, just in general. And these uh, kind of tools leverage Aruba to type the commands and see what it executes and what the results are. So it's kind of going from there. But what we actually want to do is like, you want to run the unit tests and see if our code compiles and all that stuff. And then we don't want to do the actual run. And then we, at the end of the run, we want to do the validation if the run actually executed what we wanted. We don't want to duplicate the logic saying, I'm telling you install package. Did you install a package? I'm telling you to start a service. Did you start a service? We put trust there in kind of that chef and puppet do their work unless we put like business logic based on attributes or facts or whatever of the system that we have to test the business logic at the other side where it actually got done. But don't fall into the trap like, I guess it's similar to while you're coding, don't fall into a trap, just a function and mim mimic it with like a unit test and, and just have test for nothing. That Whenever you change something here, it's just gonna change something there. It doesn't make that much sense. Uh, but in this case, um, mini test uh, chef handler will kind of at the end of the chef run, which is kind of a reporter, will run a set of commands and see if it actually did something. So that's the way it gets integrated. And Puppet has something similar uh, where you can just at the end of the run, 
execute a set of commands, see if they are okay or not, and then it, <coughs> you, can, uh, you see if it actually put the system in the correct state that you wanted to do. Is that a correct assumption that we're kind of calling this integration tests, or is that, sorry? Smoke test, isn't that more like uh, in the load, load test area? Okay. Okay, I'll look that up if that's a better wording. Okay. Again, I'm trying to find similarities and uh, like <laughs> I tweeted I was looking for the equivalent of EGBs, but I couldn't find one, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so we got the code, we got it running, we got to see if it's validated. Um, like code, you can start doing metrics um, like if you do a run, how long does it take? Where's my bottleneck? Uh, maybe I'm checking some external resource or doing a command and that it takes like 15 seconds because the DNS is not correctly or whatever. I want to have timings and metrics of my execution run. Um, if I'm adding things to my code, did I improve the uh, execution time uh, or not? So these kind of metrics start to matter the more and the larger you scale and the more complex your manifest become because you wanna have them applied instantly and not having to wait for two, uh, two hours is too long. But let's say if you do a run and it takes five minutes every time, that just is too long. It has to be like almost in 30 seconds that you can do a complete run. So you start tuning your things that you install every time to get that shorter. And Puppet Profiler is just a tool that allows you to, to make that output. Um, you can graph that stuff, like just graph it and say, hey, I've changed something in my system. The vertical lines is when I deployed some new version uh, and then I can see the performance uh, and, and see if it improved usage or load or not. You kind of make that correlation, which is very interesting if you're like if you install a new package, what did change on my system or the performance or did it go up or down? Uh, it ties into my talk earlier about getting the monitoring, the metrics uh, and as a feedback of the things you're doing. Um, if your base becomes more complex, you don't wanna run all the tests because imagine you have like 25 different machine roles that need to be installed, and I touch one part of the code base of my, all my modules, do I run all the tests on all these systems again? So that becomes a problem because it's just getting slower the more roles and types of machines you're running. So um, this knife preflight and uh, puppet uh, impact checker, uh, that's kind of experimenting, uh, for example, uh, through the puppet uh, graph like, if I touch this here, what roles or classes are impacted? So I know if these only get changed, it's only these tests that I need to rerun. So that's the part that we're going for. Um, so the more you do, the, 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 like, the more roles, this is getting ported. Again, execution time, feedback time, during your test, you wanna get it faster. So I think it's good, but it's still not like there is a lot of improvement. Um, so yeah, that's my verdict. Um, so <laughs> thank you all for being here and thanks for sharing.